I'm Robert with Nomium, and today we're looking at Zoom account settings, and at the end of the video, we'll take a look at some brief meeting settings. The settings in Zoom are important because when you set up a new meeting, the settings of that meeting will be affected by your overall settings in your account. Notice on the screen, I'm in my Zoom account through my browser. I'm not in the Zoom meeting itself, and you can find settings here on the left side of the screen. I'm also assuming that you're an administrator that has the ability to change these settings. If you're in an organization with a network administrator, they may or may not allow you to change some of these settings. I'm also assuming that you're on a paid account that gives you some of these options. And I'm also assuming that you're working with professionals. Those of you who are working with the general public and you may not know who's coming into your Zoom meetings, you may want to set up your settings very differently than I have mine set up. Zoom changes a lot. There's a lot of updates. So these settings change over time. So it's a good idea if you've had a Zoom account for a while, go back into your settings and double check and make sure they're set up as you want them to be. So we're going to go through over 15 different settings and I will list these in the video description. The first thing we see here is the host video and participant video. I have this turned off. So when I come into the meeting and when my participants come into the meeting, their video is not automatically on. I've been surprised when I've joined a Zoom meeting and my video webcam automatically turned on and I wasn't ready for it. So I like to keep those off, even though I do encourage people to turn their cameras on when they're communicating with each other. Next is audio type. To have the most ability for people to connect, choose telephone and computer audio. But keep in mind, when people are dialing in from their telephone, they're not going to be able to see the screen. They may not be able to participate in some of the functions that you have if you're running an interactive training session or an interactive meeting. I sometimes like to require computer audio if I know my participants will need to be seen to interact, to go to the breakout rooms, to take polls, and use a lot of the different Zoom functions. I like to keep join before host off because I like to control what happens in my meetings. But if I have a team that meets in a long term basis, I can allow them to join the meeting without me. No problem, because I trust them and I know them. The next set of options are some security settings that you may want to change depending on who you're working with what types of groups or how larger groups are or if you're worried that your meeting information like your meeting URL or meeting password could be shared outside of your network. We can allow only authenticated users. We can require passwords when scheduling meetings. So people have to have a password to get in. We can require passwords when people are joining by phone. I'll leave that up to you to decide what works best. I love to mute my participants upon entry because it requires them to find the mute button when they want to speak. And if they can take themselves off of mute, they can put themselves back on to mute to avoid noise and chatter in the background. For the chat settings, I absolutely love chat in my meetings for multiple reasons. First of all, I do a lot of training, so I like to get questions. I like to poll the audience quickly and get some ideas in chat. But also, if we don't allow the participants to have chat with themselves, they may find a way to chat with each other off of the Zoom platform through personal private messaging. And we do our best to keep our participants focused within our meeting, within our platform. I, I usually prefer preventing participants from saving the chat. I like to be able to save it if there's something I need to distribute. But if you're working with an internal team that you trust, feel free allowing them to save it. I also like to allow private chats, again, keeping people on the platform, allowing them to communicate directly with each other if they choose to. As we move down the list, I like to play sound when the participants join or leave a meeting, but I have that heard only by me, the host, so it's not a distraction. But if I'm involved in some kind of activity and I hear that chime, I know I can go look at the participants list and see who is joining the meeting. Or if I have a waiting room set up, I can see who is in the waiting room. 
file transfer has been turned off and on again by Zoom recently, and luckily it's back on. I like to be able to send files, whether they're Excel files, Word documents, images, to my participants, and I like them to be able to send them to me and other people as well. Again, keeping them on that Zoom platform for their communication during the meetings. Now, the next set of options involve co-host, polling, having toolbars on the screen. I keep these things on because I want the ability in a live meeting to make changes. If I need to make a participant a, a co-host, I have the ability. If I turn this off, it takes away that ability from me. So I like to keep things flexible. Polling is always great for interaction and the toolbar at the bottom is always a reminder of what we can do in Zoom on that platform. When we take a look at participant screen sharing, I trust my participants. I leave that turned on, but if I am going to do a larger meeting or a webinar where there's just a lot of viewers and I don't know if there's a joker in the room, I may require that to be host only to prevent something from being shared that was not authorized. The next option is screen sharing. Who is allowed to share their screen in the Zoom meetings? Because I work with a lot of professionals and I want people to present in the meetings, I keep mine open to all participants. But if I'm working with a large group or a new group and I don't know if there's any jokers in the room, I might change that to host only to give me or my co-host the ability to share, but not the regular participants. Next, for annotation, whiteboard, and nonverbal feedback, I like to keep those on because they're interactive. I want my participants to be able to annotate, to type, and to make symbols on the screens that I share, as well as on whiteboards that I share. And the nonverbal feedback are the little icons or emojis that people can quickly use to signal things like go faster, go slower, yes or no. And I also use those nonverbal feedback emojis for quick polls. Are you ready for a break? Yes or no? It's at the push of a button. Why not allow that ability? As we scroll down and we look at allowing participants to rename themselves, I like to keep this on just because it's fun to allow people to change their name if we want to add any personal information like their location. Also, sometimes when people dial in from a certain device, it may have the device name and not their personal name. As we get to the bottom of our settings, there's a couple of advanced settings that I'd like to show. First of all, breakout rooms. I leave these turned on because even if I don't think I'm going to use the breakout rooms in a meeting, having that turned on gives me the ability to use those breakout rooms. Breakout rooms put people in smaller rooms for more small group discussion and small group activities. And the more we can get people talking to each other, the more skill building happens and the more fun people have. I also like to allow myself to assign breakout rooms before the meeting starts. When I go into my meeting settings, if I have the participant emails, I can assign them to breakout rooms and it saves me a little bit of time in that meeting. As we scroll down to virtual backgrounds, I love to allow people to use their virtual backgrounds for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's expressive. They may have a personal picture or something they found online that they want to show off. It might even complement what they're wearing. But also, some people are in a less than desirable environment. It may be a boring white wall behind them, or it might be a messy house. And allowing people to use virtual backgrounds gives them the ability to present themselves as they want. Also, as the host, sometimes I use virtual backgrounds with content on there. And we cover virtual backgrounds in a different video. Finally, when we're taking a look at the waiting room option, I like to allow waiting rooms for a couple of reasons. It allows me, the facilitator, to let people in the room when I'm ready to let them in. If I'm in the middle of a discussion or I'm in the middle of an activity, I may not want people jumping in I may need time to debrief them or inform them of what's going on. Also, the waiting room lets people know they need to be on time to our meetings. 
if they show up late, they might be stuck in the waiting room for a while. And you can have a custom message in your waiting room letting people know you'll be within within about five minutes or whatever time you'd like to set up. Finally, I'd like to take you over to some of the meeting settings that I have set up right now. If we go to my meetings, I have a demo meeting set up here. And as I go into that demo meeting, you'll notice at the bottom, I have some meeting options. Some of these you saw in my account settings, but if I'd like to edit this meeting or change any of the options, I have the option in this particular meeting to change some things around, or I could go back into my larger default settings that we just went through. If you have any questions, we would love to hear from you.